Okay. We've hit the 704 mark, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and start. Uh, we've got almost half the signups in here, and then hopefully we'll get some more as we go along. For those of you who don't know, uh, I'm Bill Seacrest of the Fresno County uh, Public Library's Heritage Center. And uh, as I hope you all know, we're here to uh, talk about uh, Fresno's fabulous theaters. Uh, there's a lot to cover and I'll have to be brisk. I didn't want to uh, have any fewer uh, slides than, uh, than I needed. So I decided I'd go heavy and then uh, just uh, try to uh, wrap up everything as fast as I could. So uh, with that all said, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, start up for tonight. And just a few things to go over. Uh, if you can all be quiet and uh, you're, you're doing that right now, and that's, that's much, much appreciated. And uh, glad you're all here, of course. And uh, as I said, hope we have a few more to come in. Uh, use the chat box to, uh, to ask your questions. And uh, what I'll do is I'll riffle through them at the end and uh, answer uh, what uh, everybody's been asking about. That way we'll uh, stay nice and brisk on this. And for anybody who was wondering, yes, uh, the program's being recorded so we can post it on the library's YouTube channel later on. And uh, for the benefit of anybody who wasn't able to make it or they, they find out about what we've been doing tonight later on. So there you have it. And with that, we're going to now talk about Fresno's fabulous theaters. What we're going to do is uh, go through a list of the 10 best. Uh, if I wanted to cover all the theaters, we could be here for four or five hours easy but I'm going to stick with the ones that are especially notable. The beginning of a historical exercise like this, of course, is with the uh, Barton Opera House, which uh, got its start in 1890, and uh, it, uh, it, it more or less persisted until 1981. Fresno had a few uh, kind of ragtag theaters before the Barton Opera House got started, uh, most prominent of which was the Grady Opera House. But the first real theater was started by Robert Barton, who had the fabulous estate that you see here. It was way out near the corner of uh, Belmont. And uh, <laughs> as you might have guessed already, Barton Avenue. Barton was a mining engineer. He was born in Germany, uh, lived some of his life in England, and then started in with an international consulting business, made a lot of money, and then he heard a lot of good press about what was happening in Fresno, decided to come out, and he had, you know, kind of this model farm that was going out. And uh, looking around, being of a civic-minded nature, he thought, well, Fresno doesn't have any really good theaters, so he was going to make it a point to give us a really good theater. And that became the Barton Opera House. Where was it? Well, it's uh, you've got to uh, imagine uh, a point on the uh, northeastern uh, corner of uh, Fulton, what's now Fulton. Back then it was J Street and Fresno Street. And uh, actually, what you see here in, in the picture, that is that is the opera house, but uh, you have to look off to the side. Where, where you see the sign that says, Tonight Barton Opera House, that was actually something else called Armory Hall. It was a big meeting space, but it wasn't a theater as such. The theater is the structure that you see off to the right. And then there's a better picture of it. And as you can see uh, on the... Uh, just below the rooftop, uh, it says Barton Opera House. That's what the Barton Opera House looked like inside. And, you know, uh, considering the fact that uh, Fresno had been founded only 22 years ago, and here's this very, you know, elaborate, nice looking theater uh, in Fresno's midst, it, uh, it really must have been a revelation to everybody. 
they present it all, you know, eventually the, it, it started out, as you can imagine, as more or less a formal theater with comedy and drama. And then uh, later on, vaudeville began to uh, take hold. One of the sensational parts of uh, the Barton's history was back in 1904 when uh, Lily Langtree, the, Jil the Jersey Lily, and uh, as some of you know, the mistress of Edward VII of England, came here to uh, participate in a drama called Mrs. Daring's Divorce. This is an anecdote in local history that's been somewhat screwed up. Uh, if you read a book called Vintage Fresno by Edwin Eaton, he made the claim that uh, the that Lily Langtree uh, was taken out to uh, the Kearney estate and wined and dined by Martin Theodore Kearney. Uh, looks like that wasn't the actual story. She did get invited over to have dinner with Fulton Berry, who J Street was eventually named after. And uh, he was the proprietor of the, of the Grand Central Hotel here. Uh, that, that definitely happened, but there's no record of her going out to uh, the Kearney mansion just for, you know, to let anybody in on uh, that if uh, you've heard the story before. And here's something that I throw in just because I think it's neat. We never think of old time Fresno in uh, a nighttime setting or anything, but here's a beautiful shot that shows you the Barton Opera House and Armory held by night with uh, a streetcar off in the distance. It's just one, <laughs> I, I've always thought this is one of the neatest Fresno postcards there is. And uh, it's a bonus that happened to uh, depict the Barton Opera House during its heyday. Well, the Barton Opera House uh, eventually went out of the hands of the Barton family. Uh, Robert Barton passed away. And then uh, as you can see, this, uh, this went into uh, the, uh, the Barton Opera House, went into uh, Fred Voigt's hands and became the Theater Fresno. And uh, this went on for uh, just a few years. And th this marked uh, Barton Opera House's conversion to uh, more or less uh, vaudeville and lighter enter entertainment. But this wasn't to last for very long. Eventually, uh, the Barton Opera House was torn down and in its place rose a new theater called the Hippodrome. Uh, and this was in 1917. Uh, you can get some idea from this advertisement the Hippodrome was more or less a vaudeville type joint. And then they also had uh, short films and other entertainments going on. The Hippodrome was uh, not all that uh, nice looking of a theater compared to uh, the Barton, but apparently somebody figured that it was progress. And uh, so this went on for, a, you know, th th this theater went on for uh not even 10 years. And then they decided to tear it down again and start it over as the State Theater. Here you see an ad from uh, the 1928B and it's becoming more of a, as you can see from uh, the pipe organ and the, uh, uh, and the film projector, now it's becoming more of a straight movie house. And then that lasted for uh, something around uh, 20 years in that format. And then once again, uh, the, uh, the theater was remodeled under the name of the Esquire and uh, it became a Hardy theater. We'll be talking more about Hardy in the next few minutes. But um, again, uh, this was yet another, there was a substantial remodeling and this was yet another iteration of the theater in the same space. Then about 1952, the era relatively brief of the Esquire Theater ended and uh, the theater became the Sequoia. It stayed that way for a fairly long time. And then uh, somewhere in the late 60s, early 1970s, it became known as the town cinema. So after all that time and trouble, after going through uh, 
actually four different theaters. Uh, the town theater had been declining in business for a long time. And by then, uh, more North End theaters were opening up in Fresno. So that's what happened to uh, uh, the uh, Barton Opera House space by 1981. It was torn down and you can drive by it now. And uh, it's been replaced by a parking lot. And um, the building that was adjacent to it eventually became what was known as the Corey Building. Uh, this is where Armory Hall was. It uh, apparently still has some of the guts of the uh, older building. So the Barton Opera House physically is still somewhat present on the block, but not like you can see anything. And it's been remodeled to the point uh, of unrecognizability. So from there, we go to the, uh, and you'll see in a minute, don't pronounce it Bijou, pronounce it Baijo. And this was an early theater, uh, no firm start date for it, uh, right around 1908. And then it uh, persisted until 1953. Uh, hard to find an exterior or uh, interior photo of this one. So this is actually uh, from a 1935B article. The theater is... Uh, probably pretty similar to the one that was originally built as the Baijo. Uh, uh, you'll notice Gerald Hardy's taking it over again. We'll, uh, we'll talk about him in just a few minutes. But this was a kind of uh, inexpensive uh, cut rate place that didn't have uh, substantial fare going on in it. And actually, uh, there's a reason why I've put this in the mix for tonight. Uh, there was a certain person <clears throat> who left behind a wonderful written record of what went on at the Baijo Theater. And uh, some of you who are looking at this right now might, no might notice and recognize who that is. For everybody else's benefit, that is a very young William Soroyan. And back in uh, the 70s, when he wrote uh, a, a highly interesting book called Places Where I've Done Time, he talked about different places all around the world where he'd been. A number of the places were in Fresno itself. And guess what? One of them happened to be the Baijo Theater. And his account of uh, his experiences there is just a wonderful thing to read. Here's some of it. The Baijo was not pronounced as a Frenchman would say the word for a small jewel. It was pronounced Baijo, and if anybody pronounced it any other way, nobody would know what he was referring to. It was in the very heart of Fresno on J Street, now Fulton, above Mariposa, in the middle of the block, on the west side of the street. It was a silent movie theater in the shape of a store, not a very big store at that, but when you paid a dime for a ticket and went in, there was an aisle down the center of the auditorium, if that's what it might be called. There were four seats on either side of the aisle and about 30 rows. Essentially, the Baijo was a boys' movie house, and the management knew it, and booked pictures designed to please boys, cowboy stories, Tarzan stories, action stories, and comedies, and a big newsreel. If you stayed to see the whole show, you were there for at least four hours, starting at nine Saturday morning, 10 weekday mornings, and stopping around midnight. In short, the program was shown three times, but frequently something in one of the movies was so good, that some of the groups would see the whole show twice, and this meant that everybody got hungry. I spent many happy hours at the By Joe, but not, met, not nearly as many as most of the kids from the various slums of Fresno. For I always had work to do, chores to attend to, and I didn't often have four hours free in one chunk. I ducked in for an hour or two now and then, though, before between chores. A lot of kids just couldn't afford the dime to get in, and they sneaked in. I did, too. Many times, both from the front and from the back of the theater, from the alley. And here's where it gets uh, e even poetic. I don't know who the management happened to be, and while it pretended to frown on sneaking in, 
I don't think it ever really cared too much about stopping. The fact is, the Baijiu is the only theater I've ever experienced that seemed to belong to the audience. I have dreamed about it as the arena of freedom itself. So there's a very neat picture in words of what it was like at uh, this otherwise uh, unprepossessing theater. It, it, and, you know, it went on for a long time just uh, doing these kind of uh, less expensive things. Uh, here's an interesting ad from 1927. And uh, after the Dempsey-Tunney uh, fight, they uh, got it all on film and then they showed it at the Baijo. Uh, and as you can see, a $20 ringside seat for 25 cents. Best bargain in town. So... Uh, the Baijo uh, went on uh, doing this lesser priced entertainment until the early 50s. And then uh, it, like many of the other theaters, was knocked down and uh, it became a jewelry store. And uh, that was what was in the space for a number of years. But R.I.P. Baijo. And that's that story. So the third theater we'll talk about tonight is the Kinema. Uh, also on J or Fulton Street, put up in uh, 1913. Here's a preliminary sketch of it. Uh, it was it was uh, designed by an architect named G. C. King, of whom very little is known. Uh, certainly, I can't find anything about him in the record. Obviously, he was well acquainted with uh, uh, the neoclassical style. And uh, as the headline here says, the theater was uh, put up by the Roding family, same Roding family of Roding Park and the Fancher Creek Nurseries, the big Roding Nursery up in uh, the East Bay. They, uh, too, had noticed that, uh, that there was a good market for entertainment in Fresno and uh, wanted to cash in on that. There's opening night at uh, the kinema looking backward. And uh, as you can see, it was, uh, it maybe wasn't as elaborate as some of the other theaters Fresno had, but it was, it was nicely appointed for its day. And uh, it, uh, it seems to have had an orderly crowd from the beginning. Uh, here's a page from the B in 1924 that shows you a little bit more about it. You see the exterior and how, uh, they pretty much stuck to the original design. In the middle, you can see what it looked like uh, on the inside, looking forward to the screen. Uh, there's its pipe organ, and then uh, there it is decked out in, in holiday lighting. Here's a pretty typical bill for uh, 1926 at the Kinema. As you can see, they are uh, kind of alternating between light entertainment and, uh, and, and vaudeville and uh, film. And uh, that was how it uh, operated in uh, most of the theaters that were here in the in the twenties, trying to give everybody who uh, went in a little bit of everything. Uh, eventually, the uh, kinema became known as the Rivoli, and it uh, persisted for you know throughout uh, World War II and later. But uh, once again. There were other venues opening up, and uh, it kind of uh, it, it got caught with a declining audience. And you're seeing it there when uh, the theater was being knocked down in 1957. So uh, that was, you know, a 40 odd year run, and uh, it, uh, it, you know, in its day, it was uh, one of the top places for entertainment, and uh, then eventually no more. From there, we'll go to the White, which uh, was also a contemporary of the uh, kinema, but it was really a better appointed place. It was started by T.C. White. I have his full name up there, but practically no one ever used it. One of the people who was in on the ground floor of Fresno period, he uh, had extensive vineyards. He was a local, he had a number of local business ventures going. And uh, as you can see, he uh, was around until 1936. Well, by the time 1914 rolled around, once again, he thought that uh, 
uh, he was suitable for competing for the entertainment dollars in Fresno. So he uh, decided to set up the White Theater over on Broadway. And uh, there's an early rendering of it that uh, came out in uh, the newspaper some months before uh, construction started. His architect was someone named Edward Folks. Uh, Edward Folks was, uh, he had very good training. He designed the Oregon Pavilion at the Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco in 1915. He designed the Pittock Mansion in Portland, Oregon, which is kind of their answer to our Kearney Mansion. And he also, and if you've been driving around in Oakland, uh, you might have seen the Tribune Tower, hard to miss. That, too, is a folks design. And uh, the interesting thing is he had a practice here in Fresno for a few years before he moved on to other pursuits. And uh, not only was he the designer of the White Theater, which uh, you can see here in its completed form, a little bit different than the sketch, but uh, either way, uh, a nice theater on... Uh, good neoclassical lines and with that beautiful cornice on top. But he was also, interestingly, the architect of the still standing Hotel Fresno, which is just up the street on Broadway. And uh, once again, you can uh, see his, uh, his basic design style at work in, uh, in this building too. And uh, this is a much later picture of the inside of the White Theater. As you can see, it's uh, uh, it's also another uh, grand entertainment palace with uh, nice uh, balcony seats and kind of uh, and and the theater and the seating is rather steep, so uh, no uh, no hats or hairdos get in the way. And like the other theaters we've been talking about, the uh, the White had, you know, kind of a company. It, it was part of the Orpheum vaudeville circuit, and it showed motion pictures as well. But it was interesting because, uh, you know, as they went along, they uh, seemed to get a little more serious minded. And here's a ad for their. Uh, their program in uh, February 1951, an all-star cast of uh, Hollywood people doing a dramatic reading of Don Juan in Hell. And the story goes that uh, when they did this, they uh, Charles Lawton was doing a microphone check. And because, as you can imagine, Charles Lawton worked in about every major theater you can imagine, uh, he, uh, as he was doing the test, he found out what the actual acoustics of the white were. And he said, plug up the mics. If we uh, don't do otherwise, it's an insult to all the other fine people who have ever uh, performed here. That's interesting because if anybody would know about excellent acoustics in a theater, it'd be a uh, lot. And uh, he had that high an opinion of what the white was like. So uh, in spite of the fact that uh, they uh, they moved on to ever distinguished entertainment, here's the sad part. By the time 1965 rolled around, uh, here they were uh, showing uh, desperate, I guess, to get a hold of an audience. These kind of uh, lurid, so-called adult entertainments at the White Theater. And uh, as you can imagine, when something like this happens, the poor theater uh, gets locked into the sort of decline that it just can't escape. And to that end, uh, the following year, uh, the White Theater became history. And uh, here, here you see it uh, off to uh, the rear, you can see what's left of the stage. And then uh, the front is that uh, is the, the ruins of the beautiful facade that uh, Edward Folks designed. So that's what went on with the white. Our next theater is uh, the Liberty, better known as Hardy's. Uh, this time it's over on K, now known as Van S Avenue. 
uh, and it's been there since 1917. Here's a rendering of it before it was ever built. It was put up by the Einstein Company. Uh, the Einstein, the, the Einsteins were today's uh, Eaton family in Fresno. They, you know, they ended up starting guarantee savings and uh, guarantee real estate. Uh, but this was an early uh, project of theirs. They too were after the entertainment dollar. But they put up this theater and uh, it was on the, the site of the old family home. They lived next door to Dr. Chester Rowell, prominent early Fresno citizen. And uh, you can see the edge of the Rowell building still standing there on uh, Tulare Street, of course. And the Liberty Theater was directly adjacent. This one was designed by Harrison Traver and W.D. Coates, who had an architectural firm in uh, Fresno. They, like Folks, who was trained at MIT, uh, they had, they, they got a great grounding in uh, architecture and the visual arts. They studied, uh, they both studied at the University of Pennsylvania under Paul Cray, who is a justly famous, uh, early 20th century American architect. But, uh, uh Coates and Traver in this, again, were working in the neoclassical vein and, uh, they, uh, they designed themselves a masterpiece. And here we're seeing the theater uh, when it was close to uh, opening and uh, had uh, and it hadn't quite considered, it hadn't quite finished uh, being constructed. And the finished version is right there. Uh, that's in a postcard view. I, I for my money, uh, the facade of the theater was, you know, less overstated and uh, really nicer looking, the, the Liberty Theater sign, you can see at the extreme right. Uh, everything was in nice balance when the theater uh, was first opened. Then sometime later, and I've been promising to say something about Hardy uh, on a couple of occasions. This is Lawrence Hardy, who started out in uh, the motion picture exhibition business in the Bay Area. And uh, he came down to uh, Fresno and uh, began to buy and lease different theaters. Uh, we noticed that he uh, did, he did that with the Esquire, and then he did it with uh, the poor old Baijo Theater. And uh, those weren't his only theatrical investments in town. Here you see what the Liberty looked like when he took it over. And uh, eventually it became known as, uh, well, in 1931, he renamed it Hardy's Fresno Theater. And uh, as uh, time went on with them, you know, he started out with uh, the vaudeville type entertainments and then moved more into movies exclusively. Uh, here you see a newspaper ad for Ben Hur, which was playing at Hardy's uh, in 1960, offered here as evidence that. Uh, Hardy's was a first-class theater, and it was getting first-class entertainment for the time, and, uh, and and had an awful lot of showings. Uh, Hardy seems to have been very, very successful at what he did, and he was around for a long time. He uh, passed away only in 1983, so he saw a good chunk of Fresno uh, theatrical history during his lifetime. And here's what Hardy's looks like today. There's the uh, marquee as he revised it, which uh, is a little heavy duty and really detracts from the original, I think anyway, from the original uh, Coates and Traver design. But that's that, that's how practically everybody alive today remembers Hardy looking like. Of course, as, as most of you know, this has been the center of a controversy because uh, sometime back a church Bought, Harvey, bought Hardy's. And when you go in today, uh, here are some shots that were taken. And certainly the bones of the theater are there and uh, it retains something of its uh, past appearance. But uh, they took out the balcony. They have uh, changed around the seating. And there's what the uh, screen 
looks like right now. And uh, I'd imagine it's being converted to uh, digital uh, audio and video. Well, there is uh, there are some reminders of once what 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 once was in here, but obviously uh, Hardee's is becoming uh, something very different, and uh, that's where this whole project uh, hit a sore spot with uh, the local preservation movement. When you see the pictures, you can really understand why. But uh, that's the semi-sad end of uh, Artie's, as uh, most people around here have known it. After that, the next theater to come uh, into Fresno to make a splash was the Wilson over on Fulton Street. Uh, this was uh, the result of local effort. Leonard Wilson, who was involved in a lot of local businesses, and uh, then uh, J. Arthur Benham. Uh, if you've been driving by uh, Tuolumne Street uh, and looking at the buildings off to your right as you proceed into West Fresno, uh, there, there is a restored sign for the uh, Benham Ice Cream Company, which didn't exist for all that long. But it was around when the theater, uh, uh, when the Wilson Theater opened, and uh, that's where Benham got uh, some of his money. But Benham and Wilson were partners in this. And the architect they selected for the Wilson was H. Raphael Lake, who did a number of commissions in and around town. Practically everybody who's uh, watching this is going to be familiar with the Hotel Californian over on uh, Van Ness. And uh, that, too, is a lake design. As a matter of fact, uh, Lake was on the inside track for that particular commission because uh, his father, H. Wingate Lake, was the longtime manager of the Californian after it opened. So there's another neat little local connection. There's what the Wilson looked like while it was under construction. And it's interesting because on the horizon, you can still see homes and uh, you realize that by 1926, downtown Fresno was not uh, anywhere near as built up as it is today. Specifically, this was uh, taken about in the middle, this photo was taken about the middle of 1925. And then by early 1926, the theater was all uh, dressed up and ready. And, uh, you know, you can see the very ornate insides there and, uh, and, and the highly ornate exterior for that matter. Uh, another true movie palace for uh, Fresno. This theater probably had less to do with, uh, with vaudeville and such than uh, some of uh, the other Fresno theaters did. But one thing that was very big, uh, a few years after it opened, the Wilson became the home of the, of the local Mickey Mouse Club. Now, you know, before uh, Disney's later TV version, there were Mickey Mouse clubs, in case you didn't know, all over the place. Fresno had one, and they had uh, regular Saturday morning shows over there. Uh, sadly, it's, it's hard to find a photo of one that was in progress. Maybe everybody was squirming around too much, and there was too much uh, action happening, but uh, at any rate, Elmer Tushoff, who was around for a long, long time here in town uh, and died when he was in his 90s. He was the MC of the Mickey Mouse Club. And, uh, you know, they had uh, talent shows and they had sing-alongs and they had everything else that you can imagine with children's programming. And then uh, after that was all done with, they'd uh, have shorts on and uh, film shorts and then uh, a feature film. But uh, if you were uh, seven or eight years old in the mid thirties in Fresno, this was the place, to, the, the Wilson was the place to be on uh, any Saturday morning. And it was exciting over there. And here we've got the Wilson uh, in 1942. And uh, I like this photo because it shows you how back in that day, going up to the movies meant dressing up and it was a very big deal. Everybody was excited by it. Uh, look at how that theater uh, appeared at nighttime with uh, all, all the neon going on. That it, it, it's, like, it, it's a very nice setting that you just don't see today. 
when you go to uh, anybody's movie house, but this uh, this photo conveys a lot of the excitement of what that was all like. And then here's the Wilson uh, today. Uh, thankfully, pretty much uh, the way it has been for a long time. Now the home of the Cornerstone Church. And then here you see the box office and uh, the terrazzo in front. And uh, even if it's not showing movies anymore, uh, it's nice to see that uh, the theater is uh, basically respected for uh, what, it, uh, what it has been and uh, what it is today. And from there, we go to the Pantages, much better known as Warners or Warnors, which started out in 1928. The creation of Alexander Pantages, who got his start doing uh, operating theaters during the Klondike Gold Rush. He was originally based in uh, Seattle, but then uh, as his uh, theater chain continued to enlarge, he went over to the, uh, he, he decided to hit the big time and go to Los Angeles. And there, everything really took off. One of his principal theater designers was a Seattle architect named B. Marcus Proteka. And uh, you can see Proteka's work all over the West Coast and in a few other unlikely spots as well, but he specialized in theatrical design. And when Pantages decided to uh, set up shop in Fresno, Proteka was tapped as the architect. Proteka also did the Pantages uh, in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, which is still very much there. And that's a contemporary photo of it. Kind of ruined really by all those banners uh, flung off the parapets, but uh, it's, uh, it's all about advertising these days. So there's the Pantages Theater when it first started. They, uh, they had some delays and they got it up right quick. That was how it looked. Uh, all pretty much framed out, steel framed out in uh, February of 1928. And by June, that's how much it protest, uh, that, that's how much it had progressed. You can see that they were uh, really kicking it into high gear. And uh, that theater is practically complete just a matter of several months later. And I think most who are uh, in the room right now have uh, been over to uh, the Pantages slash Warners and seen what it's like, you know, the, uh, the entryway uh, decoration is beautiful. Uh, even, even the poster holders are works of art. And then of course the theater and the ceiling and, and, and everything else, just a, a, elaborate, a true movie palace, really one of the best anywhere in California. Uh, it, uh, it, it'll compare to anything you see in Los Angeles or the Bay Area. Prateka evolved a very, very a sophisticated design for this theater. Pantages got in trouble with a young girl in Los Angeles, and uh, there was a suit about all that. Uh, he, uh, she made the claim that he had uh, tried to have her, he tried to have his way with her, and she resisted. She ran out in the street. She sued him. Uh, he lost the original trial. It went to appeal. He won. But he really didn't clear his name and he was bankrupted. He lost the theater chain. And uh, what happened was that the Warner studio stepped in to take it over. And this happened, you know, the year after the Pantages opened. Pantages didn't run the theater in Fresno for very long at all. So when Warners took over, they sent a delegation of their stars, uh, most of whom are pretty much forgotten today. The two, uh, the two who probably are most recognizable from the group you see here are Loretta Young and Myrna Loy. And off to the, there's a distinguished looking uh, fellow standing off to the far right. That's uh, Zeke Lamel, the mayor of Fresno at the time, welcoming all the stars to, uh, to the town. Warner's had uh, a, a feature film vaudeville combo that eventually kind of went over to uh, movies only. 
Uh, this shows one of their features from 1938. And, uh, you know, when television came in and uh, theater attendance began to go down, uh, they began to look at other things. One was Cinerama. And uh, I don't think that Warner's was the first Cinerama conversion in town. It was actually done experimentally elsewhere. But Warner's went whole hog with it. And uh, they, they put it up. It uh, required a radical redesign of the stage area and everything else. But uh, from... 62 onward, whenever there was a Cinerama, you know, or extreme widescreen movie showing in town, if it was a major release, it tended to go over to Warner's. And uh, this ad marks the beginning of that phase. However, the Warner's, like most of the other downtown theaters, fell on hard times when uh, theaters began to open up on the northern end of town. And uh, it, uh, its business fell off. It went on the block. And uh, the person who you see here, Frank Collier, stepped in and he bought Warners for a simple reason, really. He was afraid that the redevelopment forces were going to get it, knock it down, and uh, turn it into a parking lot or worse. And he was determined not to see that happen. And to this day, the Kalia family remains in charge of the Warners. They keep it going. Uh, they're keeping it uh, productive and economically viable. And uh, I think everybody who's uh, watching right now would agree that's, that's a very honorable thing to have such a beautiful place kept going. And, you know, I, I, I think pretty much everybody concedes, too, that Warners is the grand dom of all the, the Fresno theaters and first in uh, in importance. Uh, you have to give a lot of credit to Pantages and Prateka for uh, creating something that is a true masterpiece uh, among theaters, not only in Fresno, but in California and elsewhere itself. Okay, from there, uh, it was about, you know, we had a depression between the time that Warner's opened up and uh, the, uh, the tower down on Wishan opened. And no new major theater openings uh, for that time frame. But by uh, 1939, the Fox Wilson chain of theaters began to get interested in uh, the idea of what was known as a suburban theater. And yes, the corner of Olive and Wishon was regarded as suburban at that time. So they made plans to open up the tower on uh, the northern end of town. They hired S. Charles Lee as their architect. He started out in Chicago, eventually gravitated to Los Angeles and uh, began designing almost exclusively theaters. He shifted to more industrial design later on in his career, but his theater business was going full tilt when he was hired to design the tower. Here's an example of one of his renderings. This theater, in kind of a stripped down version is uh, still uh, up and running. Uh, if you're familiar with the west side of Los Angeles and Westwood Village in particular, this is the Bruin Theater, which is still in business and uh, uh, pretty much looks the same and uh, testimony to the sturdy design that, uh, principles that Lee applied to all of his handiwork. He was assisted in the Tower Theater design by Anthony Heinsberg who uh, did a lot of interior decorative work uh, in theaters throughout the United States. Here's a detail from one of his more notable designs. This is the library at Fresno City College. As you can see, the, uh, the ceiling timbers were all intricately, elaborately decorated by Heinsbergen. And uh, it's really one of the great interior spaces in Fresno, along with the Tower Theater. Heinsbergen was also uh, responsible for the decoration of the uh, Fresno Memorial Auditorium in uh, downtown Fresno as well. It's, it's kind of restrained and stripped down, but nevertheless, uh, very elegant. So uh, Fox uh, Theaters opened up uh, the tower 
uh, as a Christmas present to Fresno in December 1939. There's the uh, opening bill of Dancing Coed and Henry Goes Arizona, uh, two movies which maybe have been mercifully forgotten by now. There's a biography of S. Charles Lee that's called The Show Starts on the Sidewalk. And you can see how he applied that principle to everything that he did. I mean, here you are uh, right at the entrance to the Tower Theater looking out toward the street. And look at how fluid and beautiful even the lines of the, uh, the, the, the ceiling and uh, the floor are. It's, it, it's really remarkable how uh, well thought out the design of the place is. And of course, when you go inside, it gets even better. A lot of the decorations you see were designed to be seen under black light. And it was interesting because Heinzbergen and his crew actually had to work under uh, specific black lighting and uh, lighting conditions uh, to make sure that uh, they would get the effect they wanted. Once the theater opened up and the colors weren't off, uh, they were that concerned about uh, detail with this thing. And uh, it, it all worked out wonderfully well. Of course, the tower is practically a tradition here in town. A lot of people right now are concerned about its fate and uh, rightfully so. It would be a shame if it, uh, if it changed very much. Of course, the beauty of it is that uh, here it is in a contemporary shot, looking pretty much like it did when it opened up in 1939. And then when nighttime falls, and uh, you see it by neon, uh, it, it looks every bit as alluring. From there, we go to the Azteca Theater, and uh, it's uh, been kind of neglected in most of local theater history, but uh, it too follows a tradition that a lot of people aren't aware of. You know, back in the 20s, uh, Ryan's Theater was operating on the west side of Fresno. And uh, as you can see, it had uh, a decent lineup of, uh, of movies and everything, but no one paid as much attention to it as they did the theaters that were on the other side of the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks. And there were other theaters too. Uh, another notable one was the Iwata uh, Japanese Opera House over on Fresno's west side. And there you see a performance uh, from sometime in the 1930s. By the late 40s and after World War II, Arturo Terrado got interested in uh, developing an entertainment venue for uh, uh, Fresno's Latino population. And uh, F Street was an ideal place to uh, put it. So he opened up the Azteca there uh, which also, and this is an earlier shot, but it also uh, had uh, a great nighttime appearance, as you can see. Hosted not only movies, but uh, also live entertainment. Uh, he perceived it as kind of an all-purpose entertainment place. And uh, it's maintained a high, even though it's uh, been shuttered for uh, a lot of the past few years. It uh, has a high degree of integrity. And here's a cutout of Contin Floss, the, the Mexican equivalent of Charlie Chaplin that was used as an inside decoration with the theater. And uh, then a couple of posters from uh, the early, er, earlier years, as you can see. And there's what it looks like on the inside. It's been updated somewhat. And, uh, and cleaned up. But again, uh, it's pretty much the same uh, as it ever was today. And uh, now, it, 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 and it's opening up uh, again, it's being used as uh, a multi-purpose entertainment venue with, uh, again, live entertainment and uh, the occasional film. And there's a shot of it today, other than uh, the, uh, the Iron Gate on uh, the bottom, it's uh, at, at the entrance, it's still pretty much what uh, you would have seen when the theater opens up in, uh, when it opened up in 1948. And again, the degree of uh, integrity is high. So our last theater for consideration tonight is the Crest, 
opened in 1949 and really marking the end of the classical theater period in Fresno history. It has an exterior appearance that almost suggests it was of an earlier era than uh, the very late 40s. Uh, it was kind of paying homage to what went on before it and uh, the design perhaps wasn't as elaborate uh, as theaters were in the years before, just like the the tower was kind of understated uh, on the inside at least. But there's a rendering of uh, how they wanted it to look in 1947. And this was yet another Fox theater that it opened up. They seemed to like Fresno really well. And there's the crest when it opened up. They too had a gala uh, opening with uh, Hollywood stars. And just like with the Warner's opening, uh, practically everybody who was there is unfamiliar, although most of you will probably recognize Richard Long from the Big Valley and Nanny and the Professor and Roddy McDowell, maybe best known now for Planet of the Apes. Uh, they were along for the opening of the crest in uh, 1949. And uh, of course, uh, they uh, at, at this point, the crest was, I believe, a, a movie house explicitly. They were, you know, now Fresno was uh, really past the vaudeville era. Uh, nothing much life was done over there. Their audience, like the other theaters, was beginning to fall off by the 70s. And so when Earthquake came out in 1974, uh, the crest showed it with a uh, sense around, which vibrated the whole theater. Uh, a lot of the people who were in there were kind of scared that uh, the plaster work was going to start coming off when the movie was was running, but uh, I don't think they had any mishaps. But this was all done to try to get people back into theaters uh, after being batted around for uh, a decade or two by television and competing entertainments. So the Crest uh, got a hold of sense around. As you can see by the fine print by this time, the Crest ownership had gone from uh, Fox to Man Theaters. Uh, Man was big at one time, and then they seemed to have faded out. If you remember, they eventually took uh, control of the Hollywood Chinese Theater, and it became Man's Chinese Theater. Lots to admire in the Crest even today, even though it's being uh, re-sculpted into a house of worship. But uh, there's the entrance. Terrazzo design, uh, simple but very effective. And then there's what it looks like uh, today. And uh, uh, obviously some changes and uh, it's not quite uh, what it was, but there's still a lot to appreciate in it nevertheless. Well, you know, today we uh, continue to progress with theaters in town. You know, we have the IMAX in the Northern part of town and now uh, Edwards Brothers has a new system. They've uh, they, they brought back uh, what's essentially sense around and then added, uh, you know, a fog machine and, uh, uh, you know, a sound effects uh, console of uh, some kind to uh, enliven the uh, theatrical performances. But uh, theaters, like anything else, have an evolution and uh, whether what we're doing today is uh, better or uh, worse or the same as what they were doing years ago, uh, I, I can't judge. It's always going to be a matter of uh, discussion. But uh, the one thing uh, that I think we can all agree on is that the era of the Grand Movie Palace and uh, the uh, mixed entertainments that went on within them was a very special one for Fresno. And uh, even if uh, there aren't many of us left who can uh, re recall that, uh, I, I think as we take a backward look to it, we can all agree that it was a, a very, very special time and uh, one that was well worth uh, remembering and uh, discussing as we've done tonight. So with that, that's the uh, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, let's see. Uh, 
if anybody wants to jump in with uh, any other questions, by all means do it. But uh, it, uh, it looks like the one uh, that we've got here is the comment. Uh, Warner has uh, one of the few original organs used for silent films. It still works. Very true. And uh, if anybody's ever seen that, it's uh, in action. It's beautiful to behold. On that note, for anybody else who is fascinated by uh, Warner's, uh, you can always call up the uh, video that Huell Hauser did some years ago on Warner's, and it lasts, I think, for about an hour. Uh, and it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and you, if you watch it, you will see that pipe organ in action operated by Dick Sensabaugh, who uh, did uh, pipe organ concerts all over Fresno for many, many years. But it's a fascinating video, and uh, anybody who wants a closer look at the theater and its history is well advised to take a look at it. So with that, does, does anybody else have uh, anything else to add or uh, is, is everything good? Well, thank you very much, Jill. <laughs> and thanks, Michelle. Okay. Well, if I don't hear anything else from the audience, then, then I'll go ahead and uh, thank you all very much for coming tonight. Uh, it was uh, thoroughly enjoyable putting this together and uh, getting uh, a coherent uh, theatrical history of Fresno together uh, for us all to enjoy. And uh, again, I appreciate you coming. Uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I hope you got a few uh, new insights and saw a few new uh, photos and uh, other illustrations uh, as we went along here. And uh, uh, again, this is uh, but one in our continuing series of local history nights. I, uh, and I hope you're having as much fun with them as I have. And uh, we'll be announcing uh, something for uh, the last busy part of December very, very soon. Uh, that's in development. This was actually a substitute program for because I had two people bomb out on me fast. I had to think of something to uh, fill the gap, so I decided on this, and uh, I, uh, I appreciate uh, all your uh, favorable comments on it. So with that, I'm uh, going to go ahead and say good night. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of the week, and uh, you'll all be uh, hearing from me when we have uh, the next presentation. Good night. Thank you very much, Bill. It was wonderful. Thank you, Mina.